Shalom, it's me, Edith, here with the second in our series on skewed scriptures. Thank you for all the feedback and encouragement I've received, and thank you for being here for round two. So without further ado, let's get underway. In Mark chapter 7 verses 1 to 23 and the parallel passage in Matthew 15, a group of Pharisees are upset that Yeshua's disciples are eating food with unwashed hands. They regard this as ceremonial defilement. Yeshua challenges them and declares to a listening crowd that it is not what goes into one's mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the heart. Mark chapter 7 verse 19 then asserts that Jesus thus declared all foods clean. This has been interpreted by numerous Bible teachers to mean that Jesus abolished the kosher dietary laws. Now bear in mind that kashrut, or the dietary laws, were one of the three identifying marks or distinctives that God gave Israel to distinguish them from the surrounding idolatrous nations and mark them as a people set apart for his service. The other two were circumcision and Shabbat, or the Sabbath. What is relevant to our purpose is that they were also part of Jesus' Jewish identity during his earthly existence. In the tradition of the Hebrew scriptures, the New Testament begins with a genealogy. It describes Yeshua as the son of David, the son of Abraham. The Gospels tell us that he was born of a Jewish mother and was circumcised on the eighth day. He celebrated festivals, attended synagogue every Sabbath, and debated with rabbis. In other words, the Gospels portray him as fully Jewish. Yet many Bible teachers seem intent on divorcing Jesus from his Jewishness and even depict him as a Messiah who came to do away with the Torah. But as can be seen, two of the signs of Jewish identity are evident in his life. Is there any reason to believe that the third wasn't? Let's find out. Long before Yeshua walked the earth as a man, God gave Israel numerous prophecies through the centuries whereby they could identify the Messiah when he came. One of those prophecies was given by God to Moses and is to be found in Deuteronomy 18, verse 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. But instead of the prophet like Moses, many Bible teachers have turned Yeshua into the prophet unlike Moses, or even the prophet who dislikes Moses. It's a mindset within the church that sets Jesus in opposition to the Torah. Let's now delve deeper into Mark chapter 7 and examine the background to Yeshua's argument with the Pharisees. The Gospels mention a body of oral tradition known as the Traditions of the Elders. It came to be believed by the Pharisees that these traditions went all the way back to Moses and carried the same authority as the written Torah. It may surprise you to know that Yeshua himself endorsed many of the traditions, except where they contradicted the written Torah. That's very important to understand because it gives the context to what took place between Yeshua and the Pharisees. It seems that the Sanhedrin, the religious authority in Jerusalem, had heard enough reports about the prophet from Galilee to dispatch a delegation to investigate him. Their job was to determine, according to scripture, if Yeshua was a legitimate prophet of God or if he was a heretic. 
but as we heard earlier they gave their own traditions as much weight as the written torah and therein lies the problem in general it was those traditions and not scripture that they used as their plumb line to make judgments when they arrived in the galilee they found yeshua and his disciples about to have a meal immediately they noticed that the disciples didn't perform a ritual hand washing before eating well this convinced them that this man was not a prophet well washing one's hands before handling food is certainly good hygiene and in these days of course it's absolutely essential but hand washing as a religious ritual was not a commandment given by god undeterred the pharisees went to extremes a later rabbi rabbi zerika went so far as to say whoever disregards the washing of hands before a meal will be uprooted from the world no wonder the pharisees angrily ask in matthew 15 verse 2 why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders for they do not wash their hands when they eat yeshua responds and why do you break the commandment of god for the sake of your tradition now have you noticed something neither party mentions food now isn't that strange guess what the disciples were eating they were eating bread the greek word for bread artos is defined as flour mixed with water and baked the pharisees didn't say why are your disciples eating pork chops but why are they eating with unwashed hands now this must have been an extremely strict bunch of pharisees because only the most zealous of them required hand washing before eating common bread no wonder yeshua took issue with them for their man-made rules this is where we come to why so many bible teachers think yeshua set aside the kosher dietary laws it's all because he told the people it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you but what comes out of your heart the gospel writer then seemingly adds thus he declared all foods clean in other words what jesus was saying was guys from now on you'll be able to buy ham pizzas just outside the temple well there are several things radically wrong with this skewed interpretation this is flaw number 1 in that argument those who say yeshua abolished the kosher dietary laws must have hit the delete button in their bibles and overlooked an entire paragraph in matthew's account in matthew 15 verses 4 to 6 yeshua rebukes the pharisees for hiding behind their traditions to avoid obeying the commandment to honor one's parents yeshua regards this as serious sin which begs the question why would he rebuke them for invalidating a divine commandment then in the next breath nullify a divine commandment himself surely that's hypocrisy if not a little crazy so what did yeshua mean by declaring all foods clean Well this is the second flaw in the interpretation it wasn't Jesus who said it but the translators you'll notice in the NIV that the words are in brackets in some early manuscripts these words don't appear at all this is what a literal translation of the text actually says food does not enter into a person's heart but into the belly and goes out into the waste bowl purging all the foods 
from the same Greek word for purge, we get the word catharsis. It's not food that's made clean, but the body. And these words aren't even mentioned in Matthew's gospel. You'd think Matthew would mention something as important as nullifying a commandment. Here's the short version. Food, kosher or otherwise, is expelled from the body quite efficiently. Bad attitudes are a lot harder to get rid of. Flaw number three is that the purveyors of this erroneous teaching have failed to compare scripture with scripture. We have four Gospels for a reason, and if those teachers had only looked at Matthew's version of this incident, they would have saved themselves an awful lot of trouble. After going through a list of the evils that come out of the human heart, in Matthew's version, Yeshua, not the translators, spells out exactly what he means. He says, these are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. There you are, the Messiah said it. It has nothing to do with food. One of the most basic principles of good exegesis is context, context, context. This is the fourth flaw. The interpreters have totally ignored the context of the dialogue, which is to be found in Mark chapter 7, verses 3 to 4. It's the Pharisees' obsession with washing things, be it hands or a multitude of other objects. The list includes cups, pots, pans, and even couches. If the disciples had reclined on unwashed dining couches, would Jesus have contradicted the Pharisees by declaring all dining couches clean? Or for that matter, would he declare all cups, pots and copper vessels clean? You can see how ridiculous this interpretation becomes. The context is the conflict between man-made traditions and the commandments of God not some imagined conflict between Jesus and the commandments of God. Finally, there are some very elementary points that seem not to have occurred to the proponents of the idea that Jesus set aside the kosher dietary laws. If he had set them aside, he would never have been invited to speak in synagogues. He would not have been allowed to teach in the temple precincts. He would not have been invited to the homes of Pharisees. What's more, his own disciples would have ceased to follow him. We see that even after the resurrection, Peter was still an observant Jew. As late as Acts chapter 10 verse 14, he says, I've never eaten anything unclean. Yet Yeshua continued to be invited and permitted to speak in synagogues. He continued to teach in the temple precincts right to the end of his ministry. He was respected by prominent figures in the community like Jairus and Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. He was consulted by experts in the Torah. He continued to be invited to the homes of Pharisees, and his disciples continued to follow him. How was all of this possible? It was possible because he never set aside the kosher dietary laws. It's elementary. <laughs> now, I've been poking a bit of fun at this skewed interpretation of scripture. But in reality, it's no laughing matter. There are four deeply troubling things about misreading scripture in this way. First of all, one is forced to ask why there is this compulsion, this drive within sectors of the church to cast Jesus as an opponent of Judaism. Is it a case of theological 
anti-Semitism? Think about it. If Jesus indeed abolished the kosher dietary laws, he was devaluing one of the God-given signs of his own Jewish identity. He was also, in essence, declaring Israel to be a nation like any other. The second problem is that it's a poor witness to the Jewish community. Remember what I said about Deuteronomy 18 verse 18? One of the earliest prophecies that would help Israel identify the Messiah is that he would be the prophet like Moses, not the prophet who came to destroy Moses. If Yeshua indeed abolished even one aspect of Torah, it delegitimizes him as the Messiah. I know this is going slightly off topic, but in a way it proves the point. Let's take another look at that painting we saw a moment ago. The first thing to notice is the gulf between Jesus and his followers and those who are identifiably Jewish. Note that the Jewish subjects of the painting are wearing a sort of Jewish uniform in the form of prayer shawls, while Jesus and his followers are not. Meanwhile, Jesus is wearing his standard uniform of a white robe and a red toga-like garment draped over his shoulder. Decidedly un-Jewish garb. Let's move on to the third danger behind this teaching. Something as seemingly trivial as a debate about food can lead to far more serious issues. Andy Stanley is the pastor of a megachurch in the United States. He teaches that Christianity should unhitch itself from the so-called Old Testament. He likens the early Jewish believers who continued to follow the dietary laws to rather slow children who would eventually outgrow their childish ways. Look to where this idea leads him. Jesus' new command, the Old Covenant, the Old Covenant Law of Moses was not the go-to source regarding sexual behavior in the church. More importantly, <laughs> and perhaps more disturbingly, if that's a word, or offensively, the Old Testament or the Law and the Prophets, as they called it, was not going to be the go-to source for any behavior in the church. I hope I don't come across as too harsh about Andy Stanley, but he is just such a prime example of what can happen when we say that Jesus uh, set aside this part of Scripture or regarded that part as unimportant, well, what's to stop us setting aside two-thirds of the Bible? Let's rather remember that when Paul wrote, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, we need to remember that as yet there was no New Testament. Let me come now to the greatest danger at the heart of this flawed reading of scripture. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 6, Yeshua accused the Pharisees of circumventing the commandment of God, which he clearly regarded as sin. Therefore, if he himself set aside even one of God's laws, he cannot be the saviour of the world, because he would then be a violator of the Torah, and as such he could not die as our perfect atonement. The very reason he could die in our place is that he was and forever will be the only human being who perfectly kept Torah in thought, word and deed. To bring this to a close, to listen to some Bible teachers, you wouldn't think Jesus came to save our souls. You'd think he came to save our bacon. And that's just bad hermeneutics. So let's end on an uplifting note. Let's once again conclude with Amir Tsafati pronouncing the ironic blessing.
יברכך אדוני וישמרך, יאר אדוני פניו אליך ויחוניקה, יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישם לך שלום. May the Lord bless you and keep you and may he shine his face towards you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance towards you and may he give you peace. Shalom.